to a podcast from the Irish Linen Centre and Lisbon Museum. My name is Kieran, and today I will be speaking to Dr. Ken Griffin, curator of the Egypt Centre Swansea. In this podcast, we talk to Ken about his career path, his work at the museum, and his thoughts on some of the hot topics in Egyptology, including restitution, display of human remains, and the implicit racism of TV's ancient aliens. Good afternoon, Ken, and welcome to Lisbon Museum. I suppose the first thing that someone comes to the museum will notice tonight is that you have uh, a slight North Belfast accent. Yep. Um, which maybe people weren't expecting, or, or, or they might have, I don't know. Can you tell us a wee bit about how you got into Egyptology and how you end up as a curator in the Egypt Centre in Swansea? Yeah, sure. So my interest in Egyptology has always been something that I developed at a very young age. I used to get my dad to take me to the Ulster Museum since I was around six years of age. And the earliest memory that I can think of was when we were in P2. Um, so what age is that? Five or something like that? I can't even remember. Yeah, five or six. Um, yeah. Five or six. And, and going to the, the Ulster Museum and seeing the, the small Egyptian collection that they had there, including the mummy of Takabuti. Uh, and that just always really fascinated me. fascinated me. It was them and dinosaurs, like most kids, I think, not just back then, but also today. Um, but of course, not many people actually go on to do their dream kind of job. I've been fortunate enough that I was kind of obsessed with, uh, with, with both of those, and especially Egypt, when my dad took me on my 16th birthday. So that was my first experience wow. of really going to the country, and that really consolidated my love for all things Egypt and just really wanted to do Egyptology. And there's very few places in the UK that do it. Um, so Swansea uh, in Wales, that was one of the few places. And they had recently opened a, a museum called the Egypt Centre. Uh, so that opened to the public in 1998. And then as a degree scheme in Egyptology, they started in 2000. So it was initially a joint honours, uh, Egyptology and Ancient History. So I started that year and I was the first year for students to be doing Egyptology. I loved Swansea so much. It's, it's got a lot of similarities uh, with Belfast to be honest so I kind of felt really at home there I started off volunteering in the museum as soon as I arrived I even remember the date the 3rd of October uh, 2000 when I started in the Egypt Centre the first time I walked in there and I've been associated with the museum ever since uh, as a volunteer as a paid member of staff working my way up and now I'm the curator of the collection and as a as a curator in the museum like what is your day-to-day work involved mm-hmm. I mean, how does your week unfold yeah, so it, it kind of varies each week. As we're a university-based museum, uh, we obviously have a lot of university students. So we may, for example, have uh, university student groups that are in research in the collection, either individually or perhaps as part of a uh, module. So what we pride ourselves at the Egypt Centre is doing a lot of object-centred learning, where we make the collection available to students, to lecturers, by taking the objects either off display, out of storage, bringing them into a room where students get to handle them, to research them, sometimes to write a life cycle project or a dissertation on the objects. So it would often be getting objects ready for that, or I could be researching uh, aspects of the collection, updating our online catalog, preparing exhibitions. Mm. So we recently received a loan of uh, around about 800 objects from Harrogate Museum for the next three years and for that we'll be developing three exhibitions the first one which will start in um, October the 7th so that's going to be on causing their name to live which is an expression that the ancient Egyptian Jews uh, to really kind of remember their ancestors Mm -hmm. so I've chosen 30 objects in which we've been able to reveal the names of the owners of these objects and sometimes their mothers fathers other family members Mm -hmm. okay Uh, and what about the collection I mean how how did it get put together where is it from what's mm-hmm. the provenance can you tell us a wee bit about it yeah yeah so the collection itself was originally formed in uh, 1971 as part of the dispersal of the welcome collection in london so uh, henry welcome died in 1936 and at the time of his death his collection was over a million objects so it was five times bigger than the louvre in paris just to put that into perspective absolutely amazing amount of objects but most of it because it was purchased at auction, was kept in boxes, in warehouses, and obviously the rental rates in London were starting to go up and up and up. So the trustees of uh, the Welcome decided that they would disperse the collection. Uh, A lot of the non-Egyptological material went to different museums Mm -hmm. throughout the world. So there were over 100 different institutions who received objects. Mm -hmm. 
and in 1971 it was decided to disperse the Egyptian collection so several universities and museums were offered the chance uh, the Petrie Museum in London who specialised in the Egyptology they were the ones responsible for selecting this and uh, the collection was really dispersed between Liverpool, Durham, Birmingham and Swansea uh, roughly a collection of I would say around uh, 16,000 objects uh, Henry Wellcome's Egyptian collection was probably closer to somewhere in the region of, of 20,000, wow. which is a staggering amount, really. Yeah. So in uh, October 19, or sorry, September 1971, uh, 92 crates of objects arrived uh, in Swansea. And the condition was that the objects had to, or the boxes had to be taken unseen. So it wasn't a case of going through the boxes and thinking, oh, this is a good object, let's take it to yeah, Swansea. Okay. It was a case it. of you take what you're given. Um, so you can just imagine these were brought back to Swansea and Kate Boss Griffiths, who was a, an Egyptologist and the wife of Gwyn Griffiths, a classicist in Swansea. Both of them were trained Egyptologists and, and classicists. Uh, she was appointed as the honorary cur uh, curator and she had to sort out the collection and make it available for researchers, for students and build a small museum around that. Okay. Wow. So that opened in the small museum in 1976 and then thanks to funding, from the uh, National Lottery and uh, European Regional Development, we were able to create the Egypt Centre as a purpose-built museum. So that opened in 1998. So this is our 25th anniversary and we're having a celebratory event in three weeks' time. Wow, it's still going strong too. Um, <coughs> uh, so we were chatting earlier on, um, Egyptian collections and, and museums in Britain and Ireland have went mm -hmm. through um, different phases, you know, uh, cabinets of curiosity to... Yeah. Victorian models of, you know, expert visitor to, you know, museums are now about co-curation and community engagement and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you, from explained to me earlier, have a, a and your museum have a particular approach to dealing with, um, say, controversial, controversial issues in um, Egyptology, such as uh, human remains mm -hmm. and, and their display. I wonder if you could talk a wee bit about that. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So we have always had a policy at the Egypt Centre, mainly from our first curator of the Egypt Centre collection, Carolyn Graves-Brown, of not displaying human remains to the public uh, for ethical reasons. Uh, there's pros and cons for both, should human remains of any culture or of any age be put on display to be seen almost as curiosities. And especially since we have a large um, school groups that come in, um, to the galleries and, and certainly I have seen in museums where you often have school kids who go around and they kind of point at a mummy and they kind of laugh and joke and don't realise that this is actually a real person. So there is reasons for, for doing it. But um, on the other hand, I do see that human remains can be displayed in such a way that they are memorialised but also done with dignity. And I think they do that at the Cairo Museum and the Luxor Museum in Egypt very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so with a nice darkened room, uh, people are told that they shouldn't be talking while they're inside the room, etc. So they're given that information. And I also feel that human remains can be um, very much uh, objects that kind of really um, uh, ignite people's imagination, but also their, their interest in the topic. If it wasn't for the mummy of Takabudi to be displayed in the Ulster Museum, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today mm -hmm. uh, talking to you or working in a museum. Uh, so they really do inspire people. Um, at the Egypt Centre, though, we, we don't have a complete body. Uh, we have arms, legs, feet, heads, things like that, which are not, not so nice to put on display, I don't mm -hmm. think, especially for children. Maybe it would be different if we had a complete body who was wrapped and maybe similar to the Ulster Museum, you would uh, expose a foot and a hand and the head mm -hmm. so that you don't have the whole body exposed or covered, but you can see a little bit about them. At the same time, fitting in with the theme that I mentioned earlier, the Egypt Centre um, exhibition we're putting on, causing their name to live. This is something that I think that is important to the Egyptians, is to cause their name to live by putting that mummy on display. We are saying the name Takabuti. For the ancient Egyptians, that is causing their name to live. That's allowing them to have an afterlife. Mm -hmm. If her mummy wasn't on display, would anybody know who she was? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Uh, so I think that's important. And I, I think it's also important to note that Herodotus tells us that when he visited Egypt 
around 450 or so BC, people would go into the catacombs and they could look upon the mummies of their their ancestors. So they were displayed in a certain capacity two and a half thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it is one of those questions that does raise a lot of controversy. Yeah, and there's no easy answer or, s- or simple answer. There's not. Know. There's no right answer. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, so you're here at the museum uh, because you're giving a talk tonight mm-hmm. as part of the museum's Egyptian series. Yeah. Um, we have the British Museum Turing exhibition, uh, Egyptian Hieroglyphs, Unlock the Mystery. Um, have you seen the exhibition? Have you um, thought much about decipherment? Um, can you speak at all about what decipherment did for the study of Egypt and ancient Egypt? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I had the chance to see the exhibition this morning and it was really great. I was looking forward to seeing it because unfortunately I couldn't get to see the one at the, the, the British Museum because uh, of the strikes that were taking place in the final week when I was planning to go there. So I was nice to kind of get to see the 10 or so objects that were brought over from, from London to be on display. There's really some fascinating ones and some very exciting and well-known objects from uh, from the British Museum collection. So, for example, they have the papyrus of uh, Nesitaneb Ishiru, which is uh, the original one when it was found, was 37 metres in length. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. One of the longest papyri ever. And that was found in the Deir el Bahri Cache, which we were talking about quite recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is a masterpiece. And quite frankly, I'm surprised that it's here uh, because as far as I know, the British Museum, they've only really displayed it I think once before, uh, and that was for an exhibition on the Book of the Dead just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But because uh, obviously you've got pigment on there, which is susceptible to light damage, they haven't really put it on display in their galleries before. So it is nice that it is here, uh, there. And uh, another wonderful object that you have uh, is the ancestor bust. Mm -hmm. Uh, The ancestor bust is basically an object that was made at Daryl Medina, um, a community of workmen, responsible for carving the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And when I was talking earlier about causing their name to live, this fits in with the entire theme. Mm -hmm. It's got the name of the individual on the front, and this was placed inside the home in order for relatives to not worship, but remember to memorialize their deceased ancestor. Uh, So fitting in with the Egyptian theme of Mm -hmm. causing their name to live. Mm -hmm. In terms of the decipherment, though, uh, it's... It's quite scary in a way to think that it was only hieroglyphs were only deciphered 201 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just past the 200th anniversary of uh, Champollion managing to crack the code of reading Egyptian hieroglyphs. So our knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphs is still, you could say, in its infancy. We're still learning new things uh, about the language. Uh, scholars are working on it, but it's advanced so much over the last 200 years. Mm-hmm. And it is fantastic. I mean, I work in a tomb in Egypt and sometimes we're finding uh, inscriptions that possibly haven't been read in thousands of years. Mm-hmm. It's really exciting. Yeah, can, can you talk a wee bit about your excavations in in Egypt? I mean, it's something I think we're all interested in hearing mm. about. Mm. So I've been part of uh, several projects working in Egypt, uh, as well as Sudan over the last uh, 13 years or so. But the main project I work in is called the South Asasi Conservation Project. you really emphasizing that excavations in Egypt are not simply treasure hunts. They're not looking for objects all the time, but there's a lot of other things that have to be done on there. The documentation, the publication, the conservation of the sites as well to ensure that they are uh, going to survive for generations to come. So the South Asasif Necropolis is on the west bank of Luxor and basically what you've got is a 25th dynasty necropolis there, dating to around about 750 BC. This is a time when the Nubians were controlling Egypt. The Nubians coming from modern Sudan. And you've got three large tombs in the area of these elite officials, one of whom is called Karakamun. Now, uh, the tomb itself has been known for 200 years, and it was recorded by an Egyptologist called Lepsius in the 1840s. But the tomb already at that stage had started to collapse. And in the last 150 years or so, a village was built on top of the tombs, which completely... Uh, really submerged the tomb and it became lost. People didn't know where it was for the last uh, last few decades. People expected that the tomb was completely destroyed. And then work started in uh, 2006. And during that season, they uncovered the tomb, the end, or at least part of the tomb. 
uh, found that it wasn't destroyed, but in fact there were a lot of inscriptions still left on the wall. Unfortunately, the tomb had largely collapsed. So during the next five or six years of excavations, we found 20 to 30,000 fragments inscribed with hieroglyphs of various chapters from the Book of the Dead, the Pyramid Text, the Ritual of the Hours of the Day and Night. And they're all formulaic ones, so we have papyri and other documents where they're written. So my job, and I started there in 2010, was to identify these inscriptions, to find a fragment, look at the hieroglyphs on there, can I identify what the words are, can they be placed to a specific chapter, etc., and then to rebuild the tomb. And that's something we've been doing since then. So we have completely rebuilt the tomb in terms of new limestone. We still have thousands of fragments. Uh, and what we're doing when we identify them is cutting a pocket into the limestone and inserting them into the stone itself to rebuild this tomb, which we hope will be open to the public in a few years' time. That's, that's, that's amazing you're doing this large hieroglyphic jigsaw. It is. It's a massive jigsaw. Yeah. It's probably the largest jigsaw puzzle in the world, you could say. It's... Yeah, um, but every year we're having so much success and with the ritual of the hours of the night, which is one of the texts I'm working on, part of that ritual is found in other tombs. But we have, for example, the fifth hour of the night and that text is only known uh, from two sources, the tomb of Karakamun and a papyrus from the Roman period. And the papyrus from the Roman period is very much heavily destroyed. So when we find new fragments from the tomb of Karakamun, we're sometimes reading a brand new inscription that hasn't been done in several thousand years. It's really exciting. That's incredible, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you can read hieroglyphs? I, I can, yeah. yeah. Although um, hieroglyphs is such an, a, a big word in a way mm -hmm. because the language developed considerably over the 5,000 years, well, 3,000 years of Egyptian history. So while Middle Kingdom hieroglyphs is the standard that most people in university would learn, mm -hmm. those date to about 2000 BC. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at hieroglyphs from, let's say, the Roman period, 2000 years later, they're substantially different. Mm -hmm. So while most people who do hieroglyphs could read the New Kingdom or the, the, the Middle Kingdom stuff, they may not necessarily be able to read uh, the uh, the Ptolemaic stuff and the Roman stuff. So how how do you how do you deal with that? Do you have to uh, go and look at other texts? Do you have to get advice or dictionaries? Dictionary yeah, okay. yeah. Unfortunately, there's a number of websites now where you can use as online dictionaries okay. for searching words, looking at the different hieroglyphs, okay. and to see how they work. Because a lot of the grammar it does change, but uh, you can kind of piece together as to what you're getting there. Mm -hmm. Okay, come on to my last question now. <coughs> so you've spent. Uh, your career, lifetime, looking at Egypt and Egyptology. Um, what is it about Egypt? Why is it that uh, not just your career, but the career of hundreds of other archaeologists and the general public is captivated by ancient Egypt? Wh why do you think it is? What's that essence? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think maybe the mystery of the country, there's just so much, but also the fascination with what they were able to achieve building these massive monuments such as pyramids, some of the biggest temples ever produced. They're, they're tombs that are beautifully decorated. And you d if you walk into some of the tombs and you see the decoration there, it's as fresh as it was when it was painted 3,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you can't help but fall in love with it. Yeah. Um, and I have to say as well, is not just the ancient Egyptian side of things, but having visited Egypt over 60 occasions, Egypt as a country today, uh, as a modern culture is is also just as fascinating and interesting and the egyptian people are so friendly really nice and i just love being there the food <laughs> is excellent as well is really <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i should ask this last question it's a bit tongue-in-cheek i asked alona about did aliens build the pyramid did yeah. aliens build the pyramid <laughs> <laughs> well i did see yesterday nasa were doing a news briefing about uh, about aliens in which they That's said right, aliens yeah. don't exist so there's your answer <laughs> um well no definitely they didn't build the pyramids yeah. um i i think this is one of these things that a lot of people now would say this is down to racism um that yep. people mm -hmm. people say well the aliens built the built the pyramids because how could a um uh, a race from from Africa who are inferior to what we are today possibly build these monuments when we can't do something like that today mm -hmm. in reality if we wanted to build a pyramid we could build a pyramid and we could do it much quicker because we have a better technology mm -hmm. but this is what the Egyptians were able to do it's very basic stonework 
people often say, well, pyramids, they have them in Egypt, they have them in South America, they have them in different civilizations. Mm -hmm. That must mean that you had an advanced race who mm -hmm. was influencing them. But again, it's very logic from an architectural point of view. If you're building higher, if you do it straight without sloping edges, it's going to collapse. Mm -hmm. If you're building it with, uh, with uh, edges that are uh, going inwards on themselves, then you're creating a stable platform. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what the Egyptians are doing. Mm -hmm. But they also associate the shape of the pyramid with the, uh, the sacred Ben-Ben stone, which is the Egyptians believed at the beginning of creation. There was nothing but water. And out of water sprung this island, this island in the shape of a almost pyramidal structure. Mm -hmm. And it's from that that all life came from. Mm -hmm. So they're tombs. Uh, they're clearly tombs. There's burial chambers in there with the, with coffins. Uh, sometimes the bodies of the the kings are even found within them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not built by by aliens whatsoever. Yeah, it's it's funny you should see that. I was reading that Angela Stein book on mummies, mm -hmm. and she talks about um, like early nineteenth century racial theories yes. about the, the hunt for the white mm -hmm. Egyptian because people thought that there was no way Egyptians could have invented or built the pyramids yeah. and also have been black. I mean, exactly. r racist to the core, but that. That, that, as you pointed out, is an idea that sort of it's lasted over time. It's just the question is asked in a, in a different way now. Mm -hmm. You know, did aliens build the pyramid? You know? Yes, yeah. And unfortunately, there's too many ancient aliens programs on TV. Yeah. Which I would urge your listeners to not watch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't watch ancient aliens. <laughs> yeah, we asked that question tongue in cheek. And <clears throat> I mean, Alona batted it right back and gave us a really interesting explanation for, you know, with the the records of the people who are involved in building yep. it and still and and you've also um identified another uh, element of the, the the racial part of that you know the, the, the inherent racism and in asking that question but I, I think it's a useful way sometimes of um like doing public history you ask a question that people have have yeah. heard or they're aware of but it actually brings you down into the from a sort of a silly entry, you get a really interesting mm. proper answer, if you know what I mean. Yeah, um, we, we do get that question a lot at the yeah. Egypt Centre. Did the aliens build the pyramids? And as you, I say, Alona said that we've got a lot of evidence that the ancient Egyptians clearly built them. Mm -hmm. They've written us documents, uh, a manual that was discovered quite recently uh, in the, the Red Sea port gives documents of uh, one of the people responsible for building the Pyramid of Khufu, the Great Pyramid, mm -hmm. in which he was bringing stone from one place of Egypt to the other mm -hmm. in order to construct this monument. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the questions that our education team said that the kids, um, so visitors to the museum, often ask is, um, did people get trapped in pyramids? <laughs> and they say this comes up all the time with workshops, so yeah. I feel like I should ask. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I had a question today, actually, from one of the people who was doing the school group, and they well, said, there you go. <laughs> are there any booby traps in Egypt? Did they have yeah. them in the pyramids? Yes, they did actually have traps, okay. uh, various traps, especially when you get to the Middle Kingdom pyramids, where they'll try and create almost a labyrinth of, of a, a maze-like kind of structure inside the pyramid so that people would go to dead ends mm -hmm. or they might fall in a hole and things like that. Um, but in reality, there's not usually traps uh, that you do find in these monuments. Mm -hmm. That being said, sometimes people do get trapped because <coughs> what you'll find is the robbers will not necessarily go in the original entrance to the tomb, but they may carve a, a new entrance into it and sometimes that might collapse on top of them. Mm -hmm. So there have been a number of cases where bodies have been found, which are clearly those of the tomb robbers that have got trapped inside the tomb. Okay. Th this is not something you have to worry about in your no, excavation? No, no. I mean, the worst thing that we have to do when we're maybe excavating a tomb is potentially going into a, a, a room that hasn't been entered in years and you find there might be a snake or a scorpion in there That's which right. is uh, uh, hasn't been put there by the ancient egyptians but it i is. fancy my chances with the traps <laughs> exactly. over the, the snakes. <laughs> listen ken thanks very much for your time today it's been an absolute pleasure um talking to you and, and uh, drawing on your expertise so thanks very much uh, you're very welcome and thanks for inviting me